All right, so since a, a changing magnetic flux will induce an EMF in a loop or solenoid or any sort of enclosed circuit, uh, we've got this fancy uh, con you know, idea called induced EMF in a moving conductor. And this is an actual legitimate way of generating power. Um, it, you can uh, have hand uh, small systems where you are sliding this conductor back and forth with your own power or you can have this on a much larger scale. Uh, this is not necessarily used in, in power plants but it's certainly very common in charging up systems. And so let's try to understand what we see here and there's an equation that's going to come from this. So we have this metal frame that won't move. This whole outer rim is metal. You have a magnetic field in which the whole thing is in. That also won't change. There's a permanent magnet or an ele electromagnet. Something is creating this magnetic field directed into the page. And then you've got this rod that actually will be attached to like a track. And in reality, too, there'd be some sort of resistor in here, probably more than one resistor. Because remember, we don't want to have a circuit with no resistance, but I'm going to simplify this. And so this rod can move, can go left or right. And so we got to determine, well, how is the changing flux affecting this circuit? Because if you see here, I have an enclosed circuit. Now, in reality, at one end, it'd be going off to do useful stuff. So it's enclosed um, not quite the way it looks. But again, I'm simplifying this all. And so let's look at the equation. Uh, EMF, which I'm just going to say voltage, is uh, negative delta phi over time, which I'm now going to change into negative delta B A over time. Now naturally I should include that theta bit, but everything's at perpendicular angles here. There's no no directional information. Nothing's rotating, so I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to treat it as 1. So I want to look at how B and A change. Well, let's look at this. As I slide this rod along, will the magnetic field change? No. What will change is the area. In the very beginning, we have this small area, and if I slide the object to the right, we're going to end up having a larger area. So I'm going to expand that area term into a length times width scenario. So I have delta B, well, my width is X, and my length is L, so I'll say B L times X over time. Now, as I slide this rod to the right, is it the L that's changing or the X that's changing? Well, it turns out it's the X that's changing. So I'm going to take that delta and actually put it in front of that X. So it'll be negative B L delta X over time. I'm going to get rid of that negative for now because, again, we're going to use Lenz's law to determine direction, not necessarily our magnitude of sign. What I want to look at is this delta X over T. What is delta X over T equal to? Let's go all the way back to kinematics. That's a change in distance over time. That is velocity. So ultimately, we can show that the EMF induced, or the voltage, is going to be B L V, or um, this, for a moving conductor, the voltage induced will rely on the external field, the length of the rod, times the velocity in which the rod is moving. So if we can make that change happen quickly, then we'll have a higher EMF. And then we can go from a large field to a slow field to a large field to a low field to a large field to a low, over and over again. And it doesn't matter, again, if that delta X is increasing or decreasing because that velocity is what matters. Now let's look about it in terms of directional information. If I'm sliding this moving conductor to the right, that area is going to experience an increase in flux. There will be more field lines that would exist in the region of space if this region of space gets bigger. Because that area is experiencing more field lines, an increase in flux, the rod itself inside the area will create a field to oppose that direction of field. So if the original field is into the page, as the area increases, the direction of field induced will be out of the page. And so once again, you're going to use right hand rule number three. You're going to point your thumb at you because it's out of the page, and you're going to wrap your fingers around in a circular manner to show that we're going to have current flowing in a counterclockwise manner as the area increases. Then we get to our largest value of area, so now we're all the way at the end. You're going to then reverse the direction of velocity, and you're going to go back to the left. And as we go back to the left, 
So let's pretend that this rod is now all the way in the end. Okay, I'll redraw it. And now the velocity is to the left. Well, you'll see the area is decreasing. Because the area is decreasing, it's experiencing a reducing or a decreasing magnetic flux. Because it's experiencing a decreasing magnetic flux, it will create its own field to be in the same direction as the magnetic flux because it doesn't like that change. So you're going to find that there's a lot of X's now that represent the field inside the loop. Once again, you're going to go ahead and do right hand rule number three. This time you're going to point your thumb into the page and you're going to curl your fingers around to show that we have clockwise current flow. And so once again, we're going to have alternating current here. As this um, rod increases in area, we'll have counterclockwise current flow, and as it decreases in area, we'll have clockwise current flow. We'll go back and forth. We're going to get that positive to negative tick on that galvanometer or on any device that you're recording with. And as I just alluded to, this is known as alternating current. All of this is alternating current because we're going from positive to negative to positive and negative to positive and negative. Let's look at this in terms of how that affects a generator then. So a generator is a device that will allow us to take mechanical energy and turn it into electrical energy. You may recall a motor from the prior unit where we turned um, uh, electrical energy into mechanical energy. Well, this time we're going to go the other direction. Really, a generator is basically a motor, but in the opposite way. So what we'll do here is see what this little spinny thing is. That's the load. Maybe there's a pulley here and there's a mass falling and it's causing it to spin. Maybe there's a hand crank. Maybe there's a turbine where water is pouring over or wind is pushing it. Something's causing this to spin. And you'll see as it spins, the loop will be arranged anywhere from perfectly parallel uh, to the field lines or completely uh, perpendicular to the field lines, which would cause no flux. And it's going to continue to spin around, going from high flux to low flux to high flux to low flux. And as a result, you're going to end up getting a uh, current that, on depending on, it's going to be hard to break it down like this. So I'm just going to go, um, you know, assuming that we can't tell because it's going really fast, it's going to go anywhere from uh, current direction in one way to then the very next moment in time the current direction will be in the other direction this way. And, and that's still moving charge, even though that maybe the net displacement of those electrons will never really change. I'll just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's still a moving charge, which is still current, which is still going to allow us to have useful energy out of this. And we're, able, we're going to be able to uh, go from mechanical to electrical energy. And this is indeed exactly how almost every single power plant um, in our world works. There are, there are very few don't use this. Uh, for example, nuclear power even uses this. Um, coal power uses this. Water power. Uh, the only the only example is that you won't utilize uh, this methodology would be like solar photovoltaic cells, which uses a different principle called the photoelectric effect. Um, so, for example, let's say we're dealing with a coal power plant. You're going to heat up that coal. You're going to burn it and you could actually have water or some sort of enclosed fluid that will be turned into steam and that steam high pressure will seek out low pressure and while it's trying to seek out low pressure it just pushes a turbine that turbine is really spinning a loop, a, co a coil, a solenoid that's uh, submerged in a permanent magnetic field inducing electric charge um, there's obviously more mechanical detail to this to how to make this happen safely but the uh, physics behind it is really simple I do want to take a moment to really quickly show you a FET simulation. Again, you can get this on your own, FET.colorado.edu. Uh, that kind of shows this idea in a very simplified manner. If I turn water on, as it falls, it's going to rotate this paddle, and it's going to change the magnetic field anywhere from north to south to north to south. And you're going to see the effect that that has on the coil next to it. If I were to show um, uh, it as a meter instead, you can see it going from positive to negative over and over again. Now I can change the extremities here by moving the, uh, I guess I can't move this, I can change the speed in which the water is falling. So if we have a high potential difference, high electric, I'm sorry, mechanical potential energy to seek out high kinetic energy, then you're going to have a stronger positive and negative or higher rate change of flux. I could change the number of loops in the solenoid uh, which is a great way of enhancing the strength. And I can change the area of that solenoid. Uh, and you can probably think of other things like increasing the strength of the magnet, etc. And this is basically how power plants work. I mean, obviously, mechanically wise, it looks a little different. All right, and that's it for uh, 
moving conductors and generators. 